Most of us are parched. We simply don't drink enough. Most of us wait until we feel thirsty. By then, we're already dehydrated. We are 60% water, and our bodies need it to function properly. But most of us are chronically dehydrated. We know this if we go out bushwalking or we do something that takes a bit more exertion than usual. But for the most part, we don't realize when we need a drink. Just a quick straw poll. Has anyone got some water with them today? One person. Congratulations, Hannah. I'll give you a badge afterwards. Oh, two people. We need water all the time. But the body doesn't always know when it's thirsty. You see, the signals are the same whether we're thirsty or hungry. Your tummy rumbles, your head hurts, you feel a bit lightheaded. These are also symptoms of thirst. The human body can go almost a month without food, but only three days on average without water. So even though water is so essential to us, we don't always recognize that we need it. So we reach for the biscuit tin instead of the water bottle, or maybe that's me. We thirst for more than water though, don't we? We long for other things. We long for stability or recognition or friendship or true companionship, a sense of achievement, a sense of worth. We long for justice, for peace, for fairness, for a world without pain, for our families to be healthy and whole and harmonious. We long for broken relationships to be healed. And the world offers us solutions that create more thirst, more desire, more sadness, more longing, a bigger house, more money in our super, the perfect relationship, bigger jackpots, the perfect diet. Just as we can mistake physical thirst for hunger, we can also feed our spiritual thirst with things that we don't need without realizing it, making ourselves thirstier and thirstier. In this passage, Jesus identifies our real need by offering us the solution. For our spiritual thirst, Jesus offers us not just a drink, but a fountain. Jesus knows that we're thirsty, and he offers not just to satisfy us, but to give us an overflow. But we have to receive what he offers us by believing it. Now, as Chris said earlier, it's a while since you were in the Gospel of John, before my time, in fact. So let's just reorient ourselves before I go on. As we all know, John's Gospel is a bit different from the others. It's not a straight retelling of Jesus' story. It's arranged around the major festivals um, of Israel's life, which all marked how important moments in Israel's history where God stepped in, where he guided or rescued her. So the last sermon that you heard in this series was from John 6, when John, where G, trip over my words, was John 6, where Chris preached about a turning point in Jesus' ministry where he offers his body and his blood, his flesh and blood to those who want to follow him. He describes himself as the bread of life, and his body and blood as real food and real drink to those who would partake. It's not surprising that he lost a few with that. It's a bit of a strange thing to offer. He was left then with a committed handful who were willing to see where this road would lead with this strange, strange offer from this strange teacher. As Peter said, he had the words of eternal life. So for those who were willing to follow, they were willing to see where it would go. So that's what's immediately before the passage we're looking at today. And today's passage in chapter 7 of John is set in tabernacles. And this is the festival where Israel recognized and celebrated God's provision for them in the wilderness. Particularly and specifically when they were thirsty. More than once Israel complained about being thirsty Twice it's recorded for us, and twice God provided water for them from a rock. The first time was in Exodus 17, when Moses struck the rock, as instructed, and the water poured out and satisfied the people. 
miraculous, life-giving provision in the desert, a true miracle. And then again, 40 years later, the same complaint led Moses to strike the rock, and again, water poured out. It's recorded for us in Numbers 20 and Deuteronomy 32, and Paul reminds us of it in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. As we all know, as many of us know, Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it, so he didn't get to go into the promised land. But still, the miracle happened. The people were given water in the desert. Israel, that whole area, is semi-arid. So then and now, that part of the world has very little rainfall. And this festival was really important for that reason. Because not only did they celebrate what God had done for them, but they also prayed for the next season to be fruitful, for God to send rain. So what would happen was that after all the harvests had happened, the grain harvest and the fruit harvest and the vine harvest, they would all build shelters on top of their houses and they would live in these shelters on their roofs for a week to commemorate their time in the desert. And each day of this seven-day festival, they would go down to the river with the priest who would bring water up to the temple to pour over the altar. And they would uh, quote and sing Isaiah 12, 3, which says, With joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. You can see how rich the imagery is here, can't you? And Ezekiel's vision of the temple in um, Ezekiel 47 is also in view here, with water flowing out from underneath the temple and coming out as a trickle and then becoming a a bigger stream and then a river, and it gets deeper and wider and more fruitful as it flows. It's God's river of life. So this ceremony, this week-long ceremony, recalled that vision and looked forward to the future temple and the future reign of God over the whole earth. So for a desert land, it was a picture of abundance and of God's power. Judea was a thirsty land. So the ceremony was about the land and the people. Tabernacles was like a set-piece festival that marked the end of the year, a bit like Christmas for us. It was the biggest time of rejoicing and celebration. Now, this chapter, which Susan read so well for us, is a very long chapter, so I'm just going to focus mainly on the second half. In the first half, Jesus resists his own family's disbelief and his challenge to go to the festival. And he goes on his own terms, which for Jesus means at God's direction. Once we're at the festival, whispers and rumours abound. I'm now in verse 12 of the chapter. The crowds are talking very quietly about Jesus. Who is he? Some say he's good. Others are not so sure. And their leaders, the Pharisees, are watching for him. These keepers of the law are so feared by the people that no one can even speak openly quite ironic really given how his brothers were teasing him earlier Jesus is clearly already a public figure he's made a name for himself without even having to turn up but he does eventually turn up on God's time sort of sneaks in halfway through and starts teaching at the temple as usual he impresses his audience citing God as his source in a way that's shockingly direct most rabbis most teachers would quote other rabbis not Jesus. Jesus claims to be sent by God in verse 28. Effectively, he's saying, here I am. God is intervening again in your history, just as God did in former times, in generations past. This is close enough to blasphemy for them to want to grab him. But they couldn't, because it wasn't his time. So after amazing the crowds with his teaching and frustrating the the Pharisees by challenging them on the law, Jesus stands up on the last day of the festival and extends an outrageous invitation in verses 37 and 38. If anyone is thirsty, he says, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from within him. John steps into the text at this point to help the readers who are reading this to understand what he's talking about, that he's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Of course, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, has been present since the beginning of creation, hovering over the waters, guiding God's people, speaking through the prophets. But here, 
John is talking about the working of God's plan of salvation, which involves pouring out his spirit into his children so they can be for the praise of his glory in the earth, living as co-heirs of Christ, as we're told in Romans 8. Now, you might notice um, that there's a footnote in the text here, which gives an alternative translation. And while I was reading for this, there's a, there's a whole lot of ink been spilt on this. So I'll just go through it quickly for you. For some commentators, the Greek implies that the living water flows out of Jesus. And some translations will reflect that. But the translation that we have here in our church Bibles shows that the living water flows from the one who believes in Jesus. As I've said, there's been a lot of argument about this. But I wonder whether we have to choose and whether both are not true. Jesus is the source of our living water, as he tells the woman at the well two chapters earlier in John 4. And those who believe in him, those who will continue his work in the world, are channels of his living water. In John 15, Jesus describes this relationship between himself and his believers like the branches connected to a vine. We need this vital connection and we cannot be disciples or church without it. And in John 14, Jesus tells his disciples that they will do greater things even than he's doing and that it's good that he goes away so that the advocate, the Holy Spirit can come. But I'm jumping ahead. What we can say here is that Jesus is pointing beyond himself to a bigger picture, a plan for the benefit of his believers which extends beyond those in front of him. He's hinted at this earlier in verse 34. Tabernacles at Jerusalem is not his final destination. As we were reminded a few weeks ago in Ephesians 4, God's intentions are to reveal his wisdom in the world through the church. Jesus had to complete his mission to die, to rise, and to return to the Father so that the Spirit could provide that vital connection. So Jesus invited those who were thirsty, those with a spiritual longing, and he offered to fulfill that longing, not just with a drink, but with a fountain, living water from within the believer. This is enough for some to believe that he was the Messiah. And he refers to the scriptures, and again, commentators have argued about where these scriptures might be, but in fact, it's all the way through the scriptures. It's a theme throughout scripture. Not just in the temple in Ezekiel, but in Isaiah 55, we're invited to come to the waters and drink. We're promised fountains of living water in Isaiah 58, in Joel 3, in Zechariah 14. These passages all point forward to the day of the Lord, the day that Israel had been waiting for. It's a picture of salvation. Even the temple guards who've been sent to take him down are mesmerized by what Jesus says. No one has ever spoken like him before. This is wonderful and strange. But the religious elite are not impressed. He's not from the right place. He doesn't have the right credentials. He doesn't tick the right boxes. He is to be rejected. So what do we make of this in Lindisfarne in 2022? Are we thirsty? What do we thirst for? To see family members and friends and neighbors come to the fountain of life and be satisfied in him? For ourselves to be refreshed and nourished and to receive all that he has for us? In this invitation, Jesus calls us not just to satisfy our own thirst, but promises to us an overflow that will bless those around us. As he satisfies us, we can give to others. As we are made secure in his love, we can be in community without needing to compete or undermine others. As we're provided for, we can give to others. As our hope is renewed, we can encourage others. As we're comforted, we can comfort others. Our part is not to strive or stress or work up good behavior, but to come and drink, to believe and receive Our part is to take in, to internalize all that Jesus is and offers. Jesus is the one who invites, 
Our part is simply to come and to drink, to recognize our thirst and to trust Jesus to satisfy it. It might seem a bit strange or uncomfortable because it seems so passive somehow. We don't look to the things the world does to be satisfied, not to money or popularity or success or clever intellectual arguments or any of the other shiny toys the world offers, just Jesus. We want to do great things for Jesus, don't we? But he calls us first to come to him with our longings and allow him to do great things through us. Now, I wonder how real this this is to you, what I'm saying today. Or whether you hear his offer secondhand, as an offer made to other people long ago, far away, or as an offer to you, right here, right now, for your life, for your longings, for your thirst. Do we believe in Jesus' words without believing Jesus' words for ourselves? We read this from a distance of 2,000 odd years, but Jesus is alive. The fact that we are here today is proof that Jesus is alive. God is, bu- God is building his church. And the Spirit is leading and guiding us as we walk with him. Even John's original readers knew that Jesus had already been glorified and had resurrected and that the Spirit had been poured out on the church because John's gospel was written after these events had happened. So is this message really for us? Well, are you thirsty? It is a question for all of us. If you're not a disciple, this invitation is for you. Come, drink and receive. If you are a disciple, come and drink more deeply of God's nourishment in his word, in his community, as he hears and answers our prayers. Whoever we are, if we're thirsty, Jesus promises us his overflowing life. Everyone sitting there under their tents on their roofs believed in the Messiah, Indeed, they were supposed to be waiting for him, sort of. They were recalling God's past acts of provision, looking forward to the perfect king that we've been learning about in Sam's teaching from Chronicles over the last three weeks. And yet not all believed the Messiah when he actually spoke to them. Jesus was asking them to believe him, to come to him, trusting that he could give them what they were longing for not just to satisfy their needs, but to become a source of life-giving blessing for others. Jesus is not just an abstract idea or concept or historical figure that we believe in or approve of, but a person that we believe. Let's come to Jesus with our needs and our longings, and let's do it believing ourselves that Jesus will do what he says he will do in the here and now. Jesus promises us an internal source of life that will never fail or run dry. I dare you to trust him this week with the longings of your heart. Let's hear his invitation again. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Amen. Amen.